is visited. The empty staff is uh, a bit off color these days. They're indisposed, some of them, some of them overtired because of Jalsa. So they sent me a message that they would be a bit late. That's why I've come a bit late. But we'll take our full hour, inshallah. Shall we start straight away? Sayyid, how are you? Fine? Mashallah. You are doing a wonderful job in Ghana, as expected, of course. Eh? Mashallah. Why don't you have another a Sayyid for yourself, a Nigerian Sayyid? <laughs> oh, <a> good idea. <laughs> eh? yeah. A Nigerian version of Jibreel Sayyid. And also, this Adesse, what's the name? Odessi? You must have another an Odyssey as well. Odyssey. We have. In Elijah Lazan. Huh? Elijah Lazan. My neighbor Mir, one of my neighbor Mir's. Is he like Adusse? Yes. How much he's, like him? He's building the mosque at Ujukuru and his family is committing eight million, eight and a half million naira. Yes. MashaAllah. Yes. So you have got <laughs> the Adusse Balubu. in the making. Yes. Hmm. In the making, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Bashir Balubu. Yes. That's another one, the printer yes. from Kaduna. Alhamdulillah. Yes. And, uh, but no Sayyid as yet. <laughs> <laughs> Things didn't change in yeah. Ghana until I brought him back from Fiji. Okay. I told Wahabs, I look here. After this, there's no excuse. I've sent you a person who is a million pan, man in organizing things and so and so. Yeah. With the grace of Allah, I know it. It worked well, Marshal. <laughs> okay, let's start. Huh? Azur Akhtas, Ayada Ula Ta'ala bin Nazir al-Azir, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Wa As uh, the head of uh, millions of Ahmadi Muslims who are in all the continents of the world, what is your reaction to the treatment? What advice, sir, do you have uh, for the Western world, particularly with regard to the treatment of Muslims in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina? Well, one thinks of the fact that none of the Muslim leaders have spoken a word in support of the Muslims in Bosnia Herzegovina. See, the problem is uh, manifold and also far too much for us to tackle it by ourselves, except in one way, that is prayer. And that is what I always have resort to. Because uh, even if the smallest state has its own identity, its own rights and powers, etc. And however big our community may be, we don't own any of those powers. So where state powers are needed for help, there we fall short. And, you know, we can't cross the border over to that yeah. area. So these are our limitations, not the, so that we do not want to help. There is no lack of will on our part. But we can't trespass into political areas which are globally accepted as such, you know. But prayers, of course, and help, general help, and also admonition, a word, a strong word of criticism, and also appeals to the world powers through writing letters, publishing letters in newspapers, writing to the media, all these measures have been taken up, taken up by us, particularly in relation to the current crisis. Now, I told American families to start pressurizing the president of what is happening. So this is this cruelty of yours, this callousness on the part of the Western powers, will never go unpunished. You can liken it unto the Jews of. Uh, the Second World War, under the oppression of Nazi Germany. But it is worse than that. There was the whole Europe organizing help for them. Means of escapes were being devised. Millions of pounds sterling and dollars were spent to relieve them from this pressure. Of course, they could not succeed entirely, but a large number of them were saved at last. But who is there to help Bosnia? See? Because all these big powers have colluded to destroy Islam in Bosnia. 
So the situation is very grave. But what we have to do is to speak up the truth, to let them know whether they like it or not. This is what you are doing. This is what's going to happen to you. In Norway, two, two three years ago, in the press conference, they asked me the same question about Norway. And I said, look here, Norway is now being criminally implicated in all this. They said, how? How come it? We have, we have no power to change things. But I said, you have power and freedom to register protests. Yes. You have not done it. And if you had done it loudly, we heard all along the European community, then that would have created some difference. And maybe the voice was carried by others. And they flashed this in headlines, you know, this advice. I said that Norway is also a criminal party, you know, accessory of the crime. And uh, this is the right thing. We must realize our position and we must register protest. You know, this was the response of the news, news media. So we must go on admonishing and we must go on helping them financially and otherwise, as we are doing, of course. But they are small things. The main thing is to save their uh, genocide. While all the great world powers are bent upon seeing them ex extinct, being wiped out. It happened once before to Bosnia and still they survived. You know, one fourth of the, three fourths of the Bosnian population are during the Second World War was wiped out. Yet it was not a belligerent country. It was not a country which was a party to war in any way. Yet they let it happen to, on, on, on its soil. You know, they fought their battles in the, on the arena of Bosnia with the result that every time the Nazis advanced or the Russians advanced, they had a free hand with the lives of the Muslims of Bosnia. So this is on record that the one country which suffered most during the World War II, outstandingly most, you know, no doubt about it, was Bosnia. No other country could even claim of a loss of 25 percent. Here the total loss was 75 percent. And they are repeating this now. But they will fail to destroy them and to complete their exercise of genocide. God interferes and does it in a strange way. The Holy Quran says, If God had not organized or arranged the defense of a poor people in a manner that the big people, the enemies, fight with each other. The following Nasa Badahum Bebaden. Some of the enemies or the powerful people fight some of the other powerful people. So in between, under the canopy of this mutual war, under the shadow of that mutual war, the helpless and innocent are saved. Like it happened during the Cold War between Russia and, and America. So that is what God has already started doing. Because Croatia is now at war with, with the, the Serbs, and at least a very big pressure will be released on the Bosnians, and it will give them breathing time and reorganizing time. And also it will punish them the hard way. Make them realize this is how the enemies capture your territories and destroy you. Although Croatians are not as cruel, not one-tenth as cruel as the Serbs are. But still, war is war, and they have this mutual jealousy, historical mutual jealousy. So, in fact, once before it happened, when they had almost written off Bosnia by making a plan of on, on, on paper, on simple, ordinary plain paper, of keeping only that much of Bosnia and giving all the rest to, to Serbia, and a Bosnia without access to anywhere. A Bosnia without the right to defend itself. In Bosnia, without the right to keep soldiers of any sort. No arms, no weapons, no soldiers. This was a plan which was about to be executed, imagine. 
mainly with the British agency, Avan, Avan it was, who yes. made, he was the architect of this plan. And uh, when suddenly Croatia, you know, started fighting the Serbians and their attention was drawn to them, they don't want that to happen because Croatia is without Islam, Serbia is without Islam. So they can't make their choices much anyway. Moreover, Germany is on the side of Croatia, England is on the side of Serbs. So how could they interfere with each other? So they keep stop short. <laughs> See? Uh, Allah's ways, so we must turn to Him. Yes. Pamit in Tayammu, the Holy Quran instructs something like this uh, Where you cannot find water, then betake yourself to pure dust. But there are situations where dust is not readily available, as when a man traveling in a car or an aeroplane rubs the back seats of the airplane or the car to perform tayammu. Uh, in these situations, the action is merely symbolic, I would say. Now, my question is, do the traditions uh, create room for these variations in circumstances? Tell me, what does the dust do to you? Let it cl cleanse you or does it make you dirtier than before? Dirtier to some extent. So, anyway, <laughs> so that is why the Holy Quran says, Swaidan Tayyiban, dry dust. Don't make them with any wet well, dust yes. because it will make you still filthier. No. So dry dust is what, what, you know, is wiped out by striking your hand against the other hand. So the purpose is only a symbolic reminder that you must not forget Wuzu. Every time you go for prayer, you remember that there is something missing. And uh, in the importance of Wuzu, will uh, come back to you every time you do Thiamum, you know. So that Thiamum is not in fact aimed at dust itself. Dust is mentioned that you have to strike something against something and uh, dry dust, comparatively, is a clean thing. You do it and do it, okay, right? And uh, if you think that there is no dust on the seats, no dust in the carpets, no dust on the walls, then you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> dust is everywhere. <laughs> you see? Everywhere. Yes. It's very difficult to wipe it clean of all dust. So on your clothes, everything, there is dust. So don't bother about the small littleness of dust or over much of dust. When without water, dust can compensate for the loss of water, why not little dust compensate for the loss of big dust? <laughs> you know, more dust. Yes. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want your holiness sir, to please enlighten us further on the real import of a portion of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 63 which states that the Christians, the Serbians and the Jews who believe and do good work will have no fear. I want the holiness believe who do believe, good work and do good work and also believe in the hereafter and also believe in the hereafter. Yes, it's, it's a must every time it is mentioned. The hereafter is also as a condition, essential condition. I want to know whether this portion of the Holy Quran <coughs> refers to the Jews, the Christians, the Serbians of the past or of the present, because the Christian all times. Of all times, because it also mentions those who believe in the Holy Prophet So that means the time of the Holy Prophet is included, you know. Yeah. That verse is, does not speak only of the past. It speaks first of those who believe in the Holy Prophet Then of those 
who belong to the people of the book and also those who belong to other books, not discrete religions, but divine religions. All of them are mentioned, was Sabihuna, are those people who belong to some book, not man-made religions, but divine religions. You yeah. can Inna lazina amanu, wal lazina hadu. It doesn't say just those who are the Jews. It says those who believe here, it means in you, O Prophet of Allah. And also those who are Jews. So who are those who, are, who believe? Who believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how could they believe in him be, before the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Obviously, we are talking of contemporary issues. Yeah. You understand? Uh, there is no problem whatsoever. If there are Jews, their Iman is mentioned. The moment they, they are referred to as Jews, obviously they believe in the book. The moment they are mentioned as Nasara, obviously they believe in the book. But it said, وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّسْوَارَ وَالصَّابِهِنَا Sabihina are the people attached to certain books, divine books, which are nondescript. Any divine books, anywhere in the world. Here, the word Iman is repeated with reference to them. In the Lazina Aminu, there's one group, the believers in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Jews, the Christians, the Sabi, Man Amana Billahi if they do genuinely believe in God, well, Yomil Akhire, and the Day of Judgment. <coughs> Sorry. Wa Amila Swalehan, and do good deeds. Falahu Majrum and Rabbahim, their reward is with their Lord. Wala Khofun Alayhim, Walaum Yazanun, there is no fear upon them. Wallahum yazanun and they will not be made sad or sorrowful. They will not, you know, grieve for anything, any loss or anything. Yazanun literally means they will not come to grief or they will not grieve. Okay? Now the problem which might have been agitating your mind would be that they are those who are other than the, the believers in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And as such, how could we expect them to be forgiven without accepting Islam? Right? But the conditions laid are so strong and powerful, it's incon it is inconceivable for any of them who are described as rejecting Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after receiving the message. Because it says, Man amana billahi wal yomil akhire. They believe in God truly and the hereafter. And the true believers are God do not differentiate between one prophet and another. Yes. It's already implied. It's a natural implication of the whole expression. Because this belief in God is described as well in the Holy Quran. They say, when we say we believe in Allah, this is evidently, it leads to this, that we will never differentiate between you one prophet of Allah and another. This is the essential condition of belief, a definition of belief. So knowing, having believed in God, for them to discriminate, between Moses and Prophet Muhammad, Jesus and Prophet Muhammad, would wipe out the whatever faith they thought they had. And they will not fall under the category of those who believe. And then if they have the fear of the judgment, how could they dare reject a Prophet of Allah seeing the signs in him? So obviously it applies or is applicable to those of our time, of the contemporary age, who have not yet received the message of Islam or who have received the message of Islam in a distorted form 
at the hands of the enemies. And uh, they are incapable, genuinely speaking, to be convinced of that message the way they received it. So what, sort of God, of what sort of God that would be if he knows that the message was misconveyed and what he rejected was the wrong message, not the right one? What sort of God that would be who would go for punishing such a man? Why didn't you believe in the wrong message? Will that be the answer? No. If the mullahs convey the message of Islam to any non-Muslim and tell them Islam means that you must take up sword in your hand and kill anybody who disagrees. And you did do this to that and do this to that. Anybody who becomes a Muslim is welcome. Anybody who wants to walk out will be murdered. If somebody cannot agree with this understanding of Islam, would Allah punish him? No. Tell me. No. No. You're sure? By my own thinking, sir. Pardon? I said by my own thinking. Of course, but why are you not so sure? <laughs> Everybody is saying his head except you, the questioner. <laughs> <laughs> There's no shadow of doubt about it. It would be no God if he did this. Yes. That a distorted message, message like this, which is against the conscience of man, which God himself has created, is rejected. Not the true message. The distorted message, which on the touchstone of every human conscience is rejectable. If, he, if somebody rejects, Allah will punish him. No. Can you believe? No. He's not still so sure. Why is it? Why I'm in doubt uh -huh. is that uh, somebody who disbelieves. Yes. In what? Who disbelieves in God unknowingly. Let me qualify it that way. As who disbelieves in God? Yes, sir. He's out of this. I think he's out of that. Is out of the, 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 self you know, the, the application of this verse. Yes. So count it out. Whoever believes in God Does go and on. who is not yet a Muslim, and he is so honest that he believes in God and acts accordingly and is a pious man, who also considers him to, to be answerable at the Day of Judgment. What behavior do you expect of that man? If the message of Islam is delivered to him, a prophet of Allah, the best among them, has come, do you think a man like this as described would reject that? He will not reject it. That's it. Obviously. He will not reject That's what I'm saying. He would only reject the distorted image of Islam if it is presented like that to him. And for that he will not be held answerable by God. Otherwise, the God Himself would be distorted. Yes. Right? Not yet. Yes. Huh? Alhamdulillah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Next, please. Your, th your introduction. Uh, I'm Harun Jalo from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. I'm a missionary. Yes, I know. Yes. How are you? Fine? Yes. Yes. Asalaamu Alaikum, Hudu. Uh, in the preaching activities in Sierra Leone, we found it very easy to convey the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyad to the Imams and traditional rulers, etc. On the other hand, we found it difficult to approach people like honorable ministers and parliamentary members. Uh, who's who Tell what? me, who is more honorable, the one who accepts the message or the one, the one who rejects the <laughs> message? <laughs> Politically. <laughs> yes. I mean, the who says, who is honorable in the sight of Allah, the one who rejects his message or the one who accepts his message? The one who accepts the message. Ah, so you get to all the honorable people, and yet you are complaining. <laughs> 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 All who stand honorable in the sight of Allah, they are accessible to you. And yet you have some complaint. Why? Uh, the question I want to 
put forward is that we want to bring in people uh, like ministers. Of, of whom you are impressed more than Allah is. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> 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 Only let me plead his case. <laughs> what he can't describe is that if we get some ministers under their influence, we'll go again many more people in a much wider area. So what he is aiming at is not the ministers themselves, yeah. but the, in, the aura of their influence around. Yes. <laughs> Have I presented your case rightfully or wrongly? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Attributed to, attribute to you something which perhaps you didn't have in mind. <laughs> no, it is, it is right. Right? Yes, so why didn't you say, why are you behaving like Haji Sai? <laughs> 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 Come out uh, openly. Tell <laughs> yes. Okay? Yes, sir. So if they don't listen to you, don't go to them. That's the answer. It happened at the time of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One big chief, well, a really big chief, you know, he came to Rasulullah Sallam and uh, there was also, while he was talking to him, a blind man came as well, of no significance, no worldly significance. Now, but Rasulullah Sallam did not hurt him at all. What he did was, he slightly frowned to let the chieftain realize that he didn't like the interference. But the blind man couldn't see the frown, you know, so no damage was done. And yet Allah admonished him. He said, you care for those who do not care for myself? And would you ignore those who, you know, come to you with, with such desire to, to abide by your advice and to listen about Allah and Allah's things from your lips? How could you do that? And he would never do it. Only it was a message through him to us, not that he did it. So that is the same message I'm conveying to you. To preach to others, weak people, is not prohibited. But to care over much for the big people, so that when they do not hear, and the poor hear, you're not yet happy. <laughs> you see? That is wrong. Right? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. The second line, the second line behind you is not your tradition. Assalamu alaikum uh, My question is that I uh, would like to get uh, uh, clarification on the, this verse. Wala taktulu awladakum hashiyata imlak. So I would like uh, to get... Uh, what do you understand from this? Where the translation is that... Uh, you should not uh, kill your children by fear of... You should not murder your children by yes. the fear of poverty. poverty yeah. Right? Yeah. So what do you understand from this? Have you seen anybody killing his children for the fear of poverty? I haven't seen. So what do you understand from this verse then? I don't... I does not get a personal understanding about that, so I, I'm asking... You don't get any message? It means you don't apply birth control of course. for the fear of poverty. <coughs> Allah who feeds you and Allah who would feed your offsprings. So if you do that, that is a reflection on the plan of things, on the plan of Allah's creation. If you do that, abstain from having more children for the fear of poverty, then what you do is you would say that Allah is not a good yeah. organizer. His planning of food and provisions is lagging behind. The rate of expansion through reproduction is much faster. So Allah is not a good planner. If, so, if you had done it and somebody said that to you, how would you like it? So the only way Allah has stopped us from practicing birth control is for the fear of poverty, not otherwise. For other considerations, God has not stopped us. For instance, for the consideration of uh, 
the wife's health or unmanageability on the part of the wife. Sometimes the wives are uneducated and are slightly sometimes stupid. And they cannot take proper care of the upbringing of the children. So if you are careful in uh, restricting the number, then it's not against the wish of the Quran. But if you think that I'll be poorer if the children come, how will I feed you, feed them? And this is a reflection on, of, on God, which is in, an insult. While in reality what we have seen is that even the poorest people, who generally have larger number of children, of course, they, they are all right, they are brought up somehow, and later on, they all become a source of income for the whole family. And their days change. A family with larger number of children <coughs> al always ends up in better days, you know, of prosperity and things go to Germany, go to Canada, anywhere, and you'll see such Ahmadi families who were very poor, but had, were large families. They are now, with the grace of Allah, you know, they're completely transformed. You know. They take care of their parents, they uh, send them tickets, they honor them when they arrive here, and you, if you see the looks of pride with this and content with which they watch their children, then you'll arise, realize the true meaning of this verse. Never practice family planning for the fear of paucity of food. Okay? Yes. Next, Saeed, what have you to say? Oh, nothing. Oh, I have something to say. Okay. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Uh, Waalaikum as Saeed Saeed. My question pertains to the harsh economic conditions in Africa. Right. Uh, we were told uh, by the IMF, World Bank, to export, export, export. In fact, I remember Ghana as an example. They gave us loans to make the roads and then cut the timber and then export. Then they gave us loan to make roads to reach the, 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 where the gold and diamond is. Then we export. But after all this export, we are still in the same uh, condition. Uh, in fact, say, that is the fraud being committed upon you. And uh, all the African governments are in fact uh, uh, a party to this crime. Why don't they open their eyes to what's happening? They help you export your raw material, not the finished goods. Yes. <coughs> and they let you, m compel you to buy finished goods at a much higher cost mm -hmm. for the maintenance of a small section of your society which has learned to live uh, like their foreign lords. So the entire economy of great countries is being utilized for the service of a few. And this is the trick. They take away their, your gold, your diamonds, they cut them and fetch exorbitant prices for the same later on. And uh, whatever raw food you have, like beans, coffee beans, etc., they buy them at very cheap price. And when you buy the finished goods in the market, you have to pay through your noses. You know, a, a tin of Nescafe, for instance, contains coffee worth a few pennies, a dollar, maybe half a dollar, less than that, in fact for what they pay to the laborers there, or the farmers. So this is the international fraud being played upon the economy of the poor people, and they don't understand. Don't accept such loans as would help you exporting your raw materials. Only go for such loans as help you build your industry so that you export things back to Europe instead of importing things from there. Right? Yes, this I discussed with your Vice President, Justice in, in Annan, very clearly. But unfortunately, the setup of the whole governments in Africa is such as uh, they don't want to open their eyes to realities. You remember when I went to see your ex-president? Yes, 
Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. You know, I talked to him very freely of everything, without chewing my words. And did he stop you or your brother? He stopped me. Stopped you? Yes. <coughs> Now, why, why, where, huh? where did your Khalifa get all this information? You see? He thought I had been living there for long. <laughs> for only a few days of my visit to Nigeria, after which I met him, and he stopped me and said, just wait a minute, where did your Khalifa get all this information? <laughs> and what did you tell him? Two I things. Told, I told him that uh, Alifa represents over 10 million Ahmadi Muslims all over the world, right. and none of them will mislead the Khalifa. Beautiful with answer. And the second you also said, he, you, you pray, uh, he prays, yes. and he's guided by Allah. Exactly. And that if he, any time he's in London, he should make sure he comes to you. Right. <laughs> See? Yes, uh, so I have, you know, done my duty by trying to enlighten them on all these things. Not only on religion, but on economy and what's happened to them. After that, if they don't want to listen, what can you do about it? Africa so, can still stand on its two feet, but unfortunately they are not realizing what's happening to them. So I have started talking to their exploiters now. In, instead of addressing the exploited who would not listen to me, <laughs> I've got a new approach to the exploiter who may listen. I said, yeah, you don't realize how much you have bled Africa already. They're all anemic cases. They want blood transfusion. How can you draw more blood out of their <laughs> arteries, but already they are themselves anemic? So do something to boost their economy first, and then you can have the one-way traffic if you like, but not without it. This is the message I delivered to Japan particularly. I said, look here, for your own ultimate uh, advantage, It would be to leave Europe alone and reach Africa directly and build their economy by opening your own factories and industry there with the cheapest possible labor available. And then also teach them the know-how. <coughs> then this will be your market. You raise their economic standard and let them buy things from Japan, but not without it. Now I understand that Japanese are now turning to this, not because of my advice having worked, but sometimes the thoughts like this are simultaneously, you know, shared by many people. So I think they have themselves started realizing the importance of Africa and the importance of their installing industry in Africa. Now I understand that they, according to the new policy, this, this is exactly what they're trying to do. Can you? Assalamualaikum. I'm Fahad Muhammad Kano. Yes. Huzur, Assalamualaikum. In connection with the present conflict in Sierra Leone and uh, your directive through the guidance of the Almighty for the non-participation of uh, Ahmadis, be he indigenous or non, what would be your advice, Huzur, for influential Ahmadis to participate in the progress of the country, to fulfill the sins of the Hadith, who will water my Iman in the present condition. If you can implement the message of the Hadith, do not hesitate to do it. But if you are not in a position to do that, how can you do it? In the present conflict of the country, it is not possible for Ahmadis to participate on either side, any of the two. It will be deadly. You know, the dream you referred to came at a moment when I was really inclined of uh, offering the government Ahmadiyya help and advice and know-how from abroad and this and that. And uh, I thought there was no harm, this is how things will get settled down amicably and in the end peace will prevail. But then one night I saw a strange dream. Hazrat Muslim Aud had come and he had come to deliver a message from God to me. And the message was that Ahmadis in Sierra Leone must not participate on any side. 
they must remain perfectly neutral and aloof. And when I go to deliver the message, already it is too late, in the sense that I see it's a strange vision, and are those viands which are from God, they are very distinct and different from the ordinary viands of one's own thinking and, you know, the, the daydreaming of people. They are different things. What I saw was that there were Ahmadi parties who were climbing a mountain top. You know, mountain peaks I saw in chains. One peak rising and falling into a dip, then rising again and falling into a dip and rising again and falling into a dip. And what I saw was, it's a very interesting vision, that Ahmadis were quietly climbing the mountain peak on one side and a mountain peak on the other. And the enemy was in between. The plan was to, Socking. you know, to uh, come and and, and, and uh, surround them, leaving them no way of escape, to scoop upon them from height, you know. And it was a beautiful plan. I of course approved of, approved of this. But I was worried so much because Allah had sent me a message and I wanted to deliver it. So I said, I better wait for them at a place where they are going to meet. Instead of the enemy, they should meet me there, and then I'll deliver the message to them. So I did exactly the same thing. I saw Ahmadis, you know, slowly creeping upon me from one side and from the other side, and when they suddenly saw me, you know, they were surprised. That instead of the enemy, I was waiting there. So I told them, look here, I have brought a message for you. Hands off any interference on any side. Don't do it, it will be destructive for you. God has told me to deliver this message urgently, immediately. And Muslim Maud himself had come to deliver. So they respond, most of them, but I see one or two, you know, being unhappy about it. They say, you know, we have gone so much and perhaps it's good. And so I tell them, the choice for you is only this. Either you follow the same pursuit, you go your way and turn your back upon me, or you be with me and forget about what you have been doing. There is no third choice. The choice is between me and your own uh, participation or partiality towards a group, one of the foreign parties, I mean. So at that one person, again, you know, succumb to this and say, no, if that is the choice, I'm with you. Allah. And the third, the second one went a little away, but I saw him hesitant in moving away. And I hoped he would come back too. And there the dream ended. Allah. So that very morning, I telephoned Sir Leon in panic. I said to this, uh, to the Tafsheer, Tell them this is an important message and there is no shadow of doubt that this message is from God. Your survival, your ultimate uh, uh, you know, interest lies in complete neutrality. Don't take sides. And if some of you have, have already done it, withdraw them. Or tell them they will have nothing to do with the Jamaat afterwards. Because that is what I meant. You, know, you, you, be, uh, you move away from me or you be with me, there is no third choice, which means that you will not be a member of Jamaat anymore. So Alhamdulillah, it was delivered in time because I learned that some Ahmadis were actually contemplating, siding with uh, either these or they, those, you know. So now you have got the answer? Yeah. Yes. No partisan uh, feeling, not to mention the actual participation, even no partisan feeling. Just leave it to God. Be completely neutral. Right? Assalamu alaikum, Some of the time, I'm Hussein Sumonu from Nigeria. 
Some of the time we meet uh, Orthodox Muslim leaders and we discuss with them, maybe we give them books of the Jamaat, some of the books you have yourself published. They ask us one question. One question keeps on coming back. And that is that, uh, why is your Halifa not reaching out to uh, Orthodox Muslim leaders of the world? This, 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 this is a, a question which is not valid. Because Jamaat Ahmadiyya has been throughout contacting their leadership from the time of Hazrat Muslim He had many a debate with the most prominent scholars of Islam, of Muslims, in that era. And he had debates directly, you know, with the Christians, with the Aryans, with everybody else. So the dialogue was started by Jamaat Ahmadiyya yes. at the highest level. It continued later on, but with some amendments. Because the enemy was so ugly in his behavior and so filthy in the language and the, what they intended was just to create commotion and disturbances and no meaningful dialogue, dialogue was ever intended. So it was not advised then for the Khulafa to directly participate in such dialogue. Some ulema were sent with prayers of course and again with all precautions that unless the government accepts this and takes the responsibility of law and order, you don't do, go into it. Okay. Have the private dialogue with every individual. So that is that was done to, for a long time. But again, you know, this uh, mischiefs erupted here and there and disorder and, and also the mobs attacked Ahmadis during the Munazara or afterwards. But still it continued till the partition. And after that the style changed. Then we started, it so happened that Allah so planned it in a beautiful way. It so happened that Ahmadis started bringing the religious scholars of their area along with other important people along with other ordinary people of every sort, from every walk of life, to Rabba for raising questions and coming into dialogue with Ahmadi leadership there. Okay. And I used to participate a lot in that because Hazrat Muslim, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi Salis sat long hours with these people. But naturally he couldn't sp spend the whole day. So I was available for the whole day at Langar Khana during those days. I remember that. You remember that? Yes. And from morning sometimes, late at night, I would only go for a prayer or a quick, you know, mouthful of something and return there. And we kept talking of this. Thing. The various scholars from every region they came and discussed things with us and most of them, you know, were obviously nonplussed in the end. And the impact it created was so wonderful that uh, people got afraid and that is one reason why they finally decided that dialogue should come to an end and they should be coerced. And uh, it is the legal action which will stop them, not the other one. See? Everything that could be done has been done. Okay. Then, uh, Sahib, uh, I'm Muhammad Mahmoud Maishanu from Nigeria. Al Haj Mishanu. My second question has to do with the prayers again. Uh, looking at the various hadith books, one observes uh, a system whereby uh, azan is called then ikama, then the prayer process itself, including bowing, standing, and prostration. Consequently, it has become a vogue in current usage among uh, traditional Muslims, whether praying individually or in groups. Ikama is called, and uh, during night prayers, they are said loud, whether by an individual or by a group. Individually or by group? What is said loud? Tell me. The the prayer. The the the, 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 the of the verses. 
Individually, it's not allowed? It's not allowed. Whether you who, who alone, can do this? Whether you are alone? Orthodox Muslims. Huh? Huh? Orthodox Muslims. Orthodox Muslims. They do it? Yes. yes. In, in Africa? Africa? Members, yes. Everywhere. In Africa? Yes. 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 Not everywhere. everywhere. Not everywhere. Only <laughs> except Amadis. <laughs> except Amadis. No, but in Africa. Yes. Not in India and Pakistan. I no. show you. No. But in Africa. That is done by the Malikis. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So the whole of West Wherever Africa the Malikis are, yes. they do it. Yes. Now, this is the first time I've heard of this. <laughs> it's, so, it's so prevalent. And therefore, they begin to ask us, why is it that uh, we are performing differently? So that is why I thought that a forum like this might uh, be useful. Different from what? From whom? Why, uh, why are the Ahmadis alone, when they are praying as an individual, they do not recite the Ikama? Well, when they are praying, mother, of course, they I do understand. Not, yeah. But what is the question? What? Why do the Ahmadis <coughs> do it differently from whom? Uh, from the traditional uh, Maliki school, school of that. tradition. From the Maliki school. From the Maliki school. Yes. 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 So why do the Malikis do different things from others? <laughs> 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 yes, answer is as simple as that. Why do they let their hands <laughs> yeah, yeah, hang, hang by their sides? By their knees now. Like this. Huh? Move like this now. They started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why were they doing it differently? <laughs> Right. So, so they the why for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we do it because we believe as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this. Yes, we never hear of a single hadith indicating that why while saying namaz alone he would recite the the surah Fatiha or the parts portion of the Holy Quran aloud. But when in prayer he would do it only in the first two rakat. And in the third or the four or the second two, he would not do it aloud. So this is the simple answer. Yes. Right? Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Al-Hajj, what? G.A. Yamuda is my name. Abdul-Ghani Yamuda is my name. Slow it because the people Al will not be able to follow you correctly. Slow it slowly. Yes, sir. Pronounce your name so clearly that all the viewers mm -hmm in the world, get your name correctly. I am Abdul Ghani, Adishina Abu Abdul Ghani. Abdul Ghani, okay. Adishina Amuda, from Nigeria. Additional? Yes. Adishina. Adishina. Someone who opened the door. It's not additional. Now I got it. From Nigeria. From Nigeria. Yes, sir. I noticed. I, I thought you were saying you're additional from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you additional? You are much a part of the And a very good woman. I noticed. Uh, a contradiction in two messages, right. which I want Your Holiness to please clear for me. Some Islamic jurists affirm that a child born out of wedlock should be disinherited by his father, but he could inherit his mother. Whereas a portion of the Holy Quran states that no body, no career of anybody. No? No career of anybody. I think... Walat Azir was Azir was Azir That child did not commit any offense. I am surprised why he should be punished okay. for an offense he did not commit. I tell you. If something happens to you, may you live a long life, Hello. will Sayyid's children inherit you? No. Why not? Why, why are you not surprised? Uh, what, what is the fault of Sayyid's children? Sayyid's children have committed no sin. Why should they not inherit you? <laughs> Uh, it, if it is proved that what? if it is proved that they are Shahid, Shahid, Shahid children, and I have, I have my own children, yes. he has his own. That's right. His own cannot. So if it is proved that your children are not your children, then what will happen? Why should they inherit you then? If it is proved. If it is proved. 
that the so-called children of yours are not your children, then by what logic will they inherit you? And then they will not inherit. Huh? They will not inherit me. And this is exactly what you are saying. And yet you want to answer, want me to answer this question, why not? You see, it's a simple case like I told, if, if something happens to A, he dies. Can Sayyid's children go and say, come on, give us our sh- share of your inheritance? No. He said, why? What have you to do with us? He said, we are innocent. Why should we carry the burden of anything else, anybody else? He said, what do you mean? It is not applicable. This verse is different and your situation is different. It doesn't mean that everybody should have inherit, should have the right of inheriting us. So all right, you tell them to go off. Maybe you say, all right, have, have a little food with us, no more, please return. So if it is found that somebody has been taking care of children which were not his own, and still he continues to do it, then it is kindness on his part. It does not give them a right to inherit him. Like you can take care of any, anybody in the world, and he cannot become the rightful inheritor of your poverty. Right? Or wrong? Right. Well, good. You're, you're clear? Yes. Still, you should say that. question, I think you do have to know. His question is, a child, for example, in Africa, in some of our cultures, it is common uh, the, the, uh, uh, by the later, the, uh, the later generation, not the, the olden days, where the culture is very, very strict on behavioral patterns of, among people, among uh, opposite sex. Now that uh, we have permissive society, a, a man he, he is in school, he has uh, get, uh, an illicit sexual connection with the opposite sex, and a child ensues, there's pregnancy. Now, in our culture, if the boy acknowledges that, well, the pregnancy is his, even though they are not married, lawfully wedded, now, that child, according to our culture, is his. Now, it, what uh, Elijah Amda is asking is, can such a child inherit the father? Of course, if it is proved yes. that he belongs to him, he has to, he, he will. That's the question he's asking. Question, okay. Thank you for, for clarifying <laughs> the whole thing. <issue. laughs> you see, I was misled to understand a completely different thing. Obviously, if it is proved that he is the son of a father, he would not only inherit him, but because the father will be beaten up with 100 stripes, maybe he will inherit him very soon. <laughs> But I think we are looking at the legal now. And according to some, <laughs> <laughs> some of the Muslims, he may be stoned to death. So inheritance will be made doubly sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you like that? I wanted to ask a question from your question. Yes, please. Now, in Islamic uh, legality, a child born out of wedlock is physically the son of the father. But would the Islamic <coughs> give inheritance to that child who is born at a time when legal marriage has not taken part between the two? This is already have answered this question. Yes. 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 already answered. I've already answered. Yes. 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 You see, but there is one more thing I must add to. You see, when you talk of wedding in the Islamic style, you must understand that the wedding in non-Islamic style was also held valid by Islam. Okay. No believer was made to do repeat his nikah in the, in the Islamic style okay. if he was already married. It didn't happen a single time. So that means the Arab custom was accepted. And that also applies to all other religious followers of, the, of all followers of all other religions. If some Buddhist comes to Islam, if some Hindu comes to Islam, you never raise questions about how they got married. Marriage is a part of custom. If customs are applied openly and straightforwardly, then every child born is a legal child 
rightful, genuine human being. In Islam, even if he is born otherwise, he does not lose his face and his honor with the society. Those who are responsible for that illegal birth, they lose their face and their, 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 their uh, honor with the society. So you would never read in the Quran or in the Hadith, the child also should be punished. No. The parents are. Yes. yes. This is a clear message to us. Okay? Assalamu alaikum. They tell me the time is over. Okay, sir. Thank you for bringing up this African question. Many a time, you know, I, did, I don't know. But these are the regional problems nobody asked me. Thank God for finding out this. Thank you, sir.